Hello, my name is Jessica Turner from KJBT News. Today I will be bringing to you a story about stewarding populations of wild American ginseng. I'd like to introduce you to the scientist who conceived this radical new idea, Dr. Jim McGraw from West Virginia University. How are you doing today, Jim? I'm doing great. How are you, Jessica? Never been better. So, Jim, can you please explain stewarding to us a little better? Um, sure. Yeah. I, I think of a steward as someone who's sort of a caretaker, someone who um, is trying to help somebody else along or something along. And so stewarding is turning that word into a verb and making it sort of active. So maybe the best way though is to really sort of explain it by showing it. Sounds great, let's go. So what exactly, what are we looking for here? Well, we're just following a trail down to our ginseng population right now. I'll show you in a minute. Oh, I'm excited. So the first step in stewarding your ginseng population, Jessica, is to mark all of your plants in the population. And I've just chosen one little cluster here to mark in the population I've been stewarding. So here's one here. We've got a small plant back here. And you can pick up these flags at your local Lowe's. You don't even have to use flags if you don't want to. You can use the ribbon flagging. Um, but I just do this so that they're easy to see. And I go through my entire population and flag it. Of course, you don't want to do this when people are looking, when people are around, because you don't want everybody to know where your plants are. And you don't want to leave your flags up for a long time either. You don't want to take them when you're done with this process. Now, in order to flag your plants, of course, you'll need to be able to identify ginseng. And, you know, you should look some pictures up on the web and so forth, but um, basically ginseng has uh, three different sizes that are commonly found. They can have three leaves, or two leaves, or one leaf. And these one-leafed plants are what we call seedlings. The two-leaved plants are what we call juveniles. And then the three-leaved plants are the adults. And as you can see, there's a nice berry on this. This is a reproductive adult. So these are the plants, and we want to be able to identify them in order to tag them. So look up some pictures and be sure that you can identify this and see that it's different from some of the other plants around it. Notice here we actually have a plant that has been browsed by probably white-tailed deer. And I can tell this because there's a little rip in the leaf petiole here. But this was a three-pronged plant. It was reproductive. Um, it's been partially browsed. Sometimes you'll find all three of the prongs or leaves have been torn off. One of the lookalikes that we see a lot is Virginia creeper. You can see it has the same kind of leaf pattern, but when you look closely at Virginia creeper, it has usually a long vining stem, and that's how you tell it from ginseng. Ginseng has a single um, stem here that's actually a fused leaf petiole, but it comes to a single point and these are often called prongs, but Virginia creeper looks different. So after we've flagged all of our ginseng plants, what we want to do is count the number of three-prong, two-prong, and one-prong plants we have. By the way, you'll occasionally find a four-prong plant. That's really exciting. They're, they're even bigger than three prongs. We want to count them in order to provide sort of a baseline uh, census of our population. What we're really doing here is seeing what we've got to start with. And that provides us a way of sort of calibrating the effect of our stewarding process because when we come back year after year, we'll be able to see the effects of what we're doing. The next step in stewarding your ginseng population is to create a map. And what I like to do with a map is find my fixed objects. They aren't going to change position from one year to the next. So for example, if there's a rock near my population, I'll draw that rock in there. And then maybe there's a tree over here. And so I might put, for example, a maple tree. I might even say that it's a six inch maple tree. And then if I have some little shrubs that are nearby, I might draw little circles to indicate that it's shrubs. I'm putting SB because I know these shrubs happen to be spice bush. And here are some more shrubs that are kind of down below my little population. And so I want to just put in objects in the map that are going to be there next year. And then I'll draw a picture of where my plants are on this little map. And so I would, for example, put a triangle where there's a three prong, because that's three sides, 
I might put an X where there's a two-prong plant. In this particular population, I have two three-prong plants, a two-prong plant, and then down to the right here, I have a little one-prong plant. Okay, so I could even write on there one, two, three, but by using an X for two, a dot for one, a triangle for three, it's easy to find these plants again next year in position relative to the map and the spice bush. If you have a lot of plants, you might produce several of these little maps that are representing your different clusters in your population. This shows where the clusters are relative to large trees that are found, including down trees as well as trees that are standing in the population. All of this helps you to refine your plants the next year. Now, some people ask me, why don't you just GPS your plants? Well, you could do that. Um, and in fact, it's not a bad idea if you have a kind of a spread out population to GPS your site so you can be sure that you can get back to that the next year. But in terms of GPSing individual plants, really the signal is not sensitive enough to be able to map individuals. The next step and the most important part of stewarding your ginseng population is planting the seeds. So here we have a reproductive plant, it has a nice red berry, and I'm going to plant this berry to improve its prospects for actually germinating. Now if I leave the berry on the plant, it does a couple of things. One, it attracts harvesters that might see it there. So I want to bury this seed, get it out of sight. Two, an animal might carry it off, and that might be okay, except some animals are seed predators. So by burying it, we actually protect the seed in a couple of different ways. So what we do when we optimally plant a seed is we take the seed and we plant it uh, about a half inch to an inch deep, depending upon how dense the soil is. So it's a very loose soil, we could put it about an inch deep. If it's kind of clay soil, then maybe only a half an inch. So the question is, where do I plant the seed? And what you want to think about is where do you want that plant to come up? And generally, I choose a place about a foot to maybe three feet, four feet, five feet away from the parent plant. I don't actually plant it under the parent plant. And that's for a couple of reasons. One, I don't want to create a patch that's too dense here. I also worry that sometimes the parent plant might have a disease that is going to pass on to the seedling and cause it to kill it. So I want to actually go a little bit of a distance away. So here I'm just for demonstration, I'm not going to go very far. But just make a little hole with your finger, feel how loose the soil is, and drop the seed in. It doesn't have to be a fancy operation. Then push the soil back over, pat it down a little bit, and then you're done. Now the question is when do we do this seed planting? Well, I've already discovered here that a seed has been dropped already by this ginseng plant, and I would actually take those drop seeds and plant those as well. So I might make another hole a little distance from the first one, drop that one in, and plant that. Now I've got two offspring coming up in a couple of years. Now all of this talk about planting berries reminds me to tell you the most important thing about stewarding your ginseng population is the timing of it because we want to time it so that the berries are mostly red, but we also want to do this stewarding process before the harvest season, if possible. So, think about it with respect to your state's timing of the harvest season. In West Virginia, that happens to be September 1st. Kentucky has now changed to September 1st as well. Um, other states have different starts of their harvest season. So you want to be aware of that and try to get to stewarding your population right before harvest season starts, but when the berries are mostly ripe. That may mean waiting till a little bit after of harvest season if you find the berries are all green and they're small. Now a large fat green berry will actually produce a seed that germinates. So don't worry if you have a few green berries that are fat, you can plant those and they should do okay. But you want most of your berries to be red. If they're very tiny green berries, they aren't going to produce germinable seed. And you can't plant them, it won't do you any good to plant them anyway, uh, to help steward your ginseng population. So the final step in stewarding your ginseng population is to actually pluck the top off of your plant. Now why are you going to do this? You're going to do this so that you hide your population from the harvesters. So I usually twist the sympodium and pull it off like that. And I usually just discard this, the top and I put it some distance away so that 
someone couldn't find the stem. Now, I might also uh, pinch off this deer browsed one because it's pretty big and someone might see that. What about the smaller plants? Um, if they're small and inconspicuous, I probably would just leave them because they shouldn't be harvested anyway and people are much less likely to notice them. But these large plants, you want to snip the top off. Now you might think you are damaging the plant by doing that, but we've actually done studies that show that if you do it late in the season, the end of August, early September, that doesn't harm the plants at all. They've already stored their carbohydrates for next year's growth and they're going to grow just fine. So you won't do them any harm and you've ensured the reproduction of their progeny and um, that's all you have to do. Well that all seems simple enough. What can a landowner expect to see as a result of stewarding their wild ginseng population? Well it's really pretty neat. Um, this particular population I've been stewarding since about 2005 and I've come back every fall, planted the berries and uh, this particular year I was really pleased because I found out that the population had actually grown from an initial size of about 40, 41 plants up to 150 plants. Wow. So it has more than tripled in size in the last six years. That's wonderful. So this is amazing because it's a really slow growing, kind of unassuming, it's not a weedy plant, but I've been able to steward this population to triple in size. And therefore, I feel like this population is much more stable for the long term in response to all kinds of things that might happen in the environment. That's great. Thank you so much. So there you have it, folks. Want to help conserve a really cool plant? Want to make sure that ginseng's around for future generations so your grandchildren can see it someday? Try stewarding your own population of wild American ginseng and be part of the solution to the problem of the dwindling population. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Uh, this is Jessica Turner for KJVT News signing off. Stay classy. Well, I thought that went really, really well. Yeah, that wasn't bad. You were, you were really good. Oh, thank you. You. I no, no, you were. <laughs>